Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Hello, everybody in the St. Francis room. Hello, St. Francis room. Well done. That was really good. Um, I and my beard are both happy to be here tonight. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to start out by talking about, actually, I had this, I had this thought after Mass, actually during Mass, I thought, I want to do a Q&A session tonight. And then I thought, I should ask Joe if I should do that. Because that wasn't advertised at all. And so I was like, people will probably be upset. So <laughs> here's what we're going to do. We have a limited amount of time. If I get through the stuff in the limited amount of time, then we'll be able to have like a question and answer session. If we don't, then we won't. And then instead we'll have adoration of Jesus in the Eucharist, which is, which is way better. Which is way better. So um, the other day, I was uh, talking with one of our, our college students. He's a, he's a fifth year senior this year, so victory lap year. And, um, and he said, Father Mike, you were out for a walk around campus, and he said, so Father Mike, how do you think this year is going? Like, how do you think the ministry is going? And uh, he's been involved, you know, for all the years. And I said, well, I, I, I think that it's going well. I think that there's some things where there's, God, God is bringing fruit here on campus, and, and da, da, da. And he said, well, what, what's your metric? Like, how do you tell whether it's going well or not? Which is a really good question. He is an engineer, and so that's how you can tell. They have those questions like, you know, how do you measure whether the, the, campuses, camp, the campus ministry is fruitful or not? What's your metric? And I said, well, I think I thought about it, and I said, my, our metric, the metric I always use is maturity. Like, spiritual maturity is my measurement for whether the ministry is going well, if it's fruitful, or if it's not fruitful. Because it's really easy, as you guys all know, it's really easy to be very excited when everyone's excited. But it is difficult to take responsibility for your own faith when no one else does. And one of the key keys of spiritual maturity is, like he said, he said, well, how do you measure maturity? And I said, well, it ultimately comes down to whether or not someone's willing to take responsibility for their own spiritual life or not. So the way I try to measure spiritual maturity it's not, is someone perfect? It's not, it's not, are they doing really, really well? It's not, do they have to go to confession again? Oh my gosh. No, that's not what it is. It is, to what degree are they willing to take responsibility for their own spiritual life? And to what degree do they rely upon someone else to take responsibility for their spiritual life? And this is, this is, the, this is I, in so many ways, I think this is one of the keys. Because if we, we base our spiritual maturity off of perfection, then we'll never be there. And we're not even called to go there. If we base our spiritual maturity off of, do we do all the tasks? Do I do all the things? Do I, am I, am I um, doing all the religious practices? Then again, that's not bad, but it's not enough. But to take responsibility for your own spiritual life is going to be the key that makes all of the difference between a saint and someone who inherited a fortune and then just squandered it because they didn't know how to spend it because they weren't willing to take responsibility for their inheritance. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you. The one person is like, I think I'm cracking with your father. Okay. So, <laughs> because I'm going to say this because, okay, doing, you know, doing all the things, checking the boxes, I wanna, duty is good. <laughs> duty. Um, <laughs> D-U-T-Y. D-O-O-D-Y is also good, but like a different kind of good. But duty, D-U-T-Y, is good. Duty is a bad word. I, I can't say it anymore. Um, that's all I'm going to think. To be given a task and to do that task because it's been entrusted to you is a good thing. So if you realize, okay, as a Catholic Christian, I've been called to pray, regardless of whether I feel like it or not. See, do it because it's your duty. Good, good. <laughs> now we're thinking, yeah, sorry, you guys. <laughs> we have to think of another word. You do it because it's your job? Do it because it's in, been entrusted to you? Do it because it is... Your obligation is a good word. Obligation is a holy word.
Check this out. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our Lord. Lo our... Where's my book? Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give God thanks and praise. Doing the obligation is connected to our salvation. See, but again, just like the D word is a bad word, so oftentimes we consider the O obligation word a bad word. Because why? Because I want to be fr I want to be free. Like again, you Catholics. Yep, you're all about discipline. You're all about obligation. You're all about duty. <laughs> duty. Duty. <laughs> He's angry about it. The men's room is right out the door. <laughs> and yet, saints. In fact, one of the saints on the wall, the one sitting on, standing on top of the mountain there. So once the, the saint standing out of the mountain, uh, blessed Pier Giorgio Fassati, he once said this. Woohoo, Pier Giorgio. He said, yeah. yeah, there he is. To live without faith, to live without a heritage to defend, without battling constantly for truth, this is not to live, but to get along. And we must never just get along. To live without a faith to fight for, without an obligation to live for, without, as he said, a heritage, an inheritance to defend, battling for truth, that is not to live, that's to get along, and we must never just get along. So I measure maturity, measure like spiritual growth based off maturity, and that maturity is connected to to what degree is someone willing to take the, the heritage they've been given, the inheritance they've been given, take responsibility for it and say, what, God, what do you want me to do with the inheritance you've given me? Regardless of what everyone else is doing, not just to get along, but what are you calling me to do with the inheritance you've given me? Because that is my obligation. That is my responsibility. That is my duty. <laughs> and the degree, how I many I say this? Um, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. In our culture, we have very few ways of determining whether you're an adult or not. I mean, maybe I say it like this. We, in our culture, we have so many ways to determine whether you're an adult or not um, that no one knows if they are until you start using that word as a verb, which is the most annoying thing. At first, it was cute. But then it's like, oh, adulting is hard. Like, okay, if you verb one more word, I am going to turn this car around and we're going to go back. No one goes to Valley Fair. Like, we are a culture. We're like, what is it to be an adult? Is it when you get your driver's license? Is it when you can vote? Is it when you can buy a pack of cigarettes? Is it when you can drink legally? Is it when you join the military? Is it when you get married? Is it when you get your first job? Like, when is it that you're an adult? And around the world, cultures have been able to say, okay, here's the rite of passage, now you're an adult. But we don't have one of those. So it becomes an, almost an individual thing. I hate that, but it is kind of the case. How do, you be, how do you know if I'm mature or not? Well, I'll say it like this. One of the marks of adulthood, the mark of maturity... It's not now you can do something you couldn't do because you were too young. The mark of maturity is a willingness to take responsibility. The mark of adulthood is I'm willing to take responsibility for myself. A mark of even more mature adulthood is I'm not only willing to take responsibility for myself, I'm willing to take responsibility for those around me. That's one of the reasons why you had 17 and 18 year old young men in World War II Responding to the call of duty in order, in order to defend freedom. They were not adults because they simply joined the military. They were not adults simply because they had to live through terrible circumstances. They were adults at 17. They were adults at 18 because they said, there's a job to do. It's my responsibility. 
it is really easy to say there's a job to do, someone else do it, someone else do it. I got stuff going on. It's really easy to say, because I, you know, I work on a college campus, so it's really easy to say, listen, these four years are for me. This is, these are my four years. Those are the four more selfish years of a person's life, almost. The years of college, four most selfish years in a person's life, which also means that they are oftentimes the four most useless years in a, in a person's life. I'm going to say that five more times until I get it right. For many, many people, the four or five or six years of college are their most, the most selfish years of their life, and therefore, they are often the most useless years of their lives. Because it's a year that I, the years I just spend on myself. I talk to our college students, and they, they, even, they even, they agree with me in saying that there, there can be days, weeks that they go through where they don't have to make one decision for someone else. They don't have to take, they don't have to take responsibility for one person other than themselves. They don't have to bend to anyone other than themselves. But when I got to college, I'm an adult. No, no. You become an adult the moment you take responsibility for yourself, what's been entrusted to you. Which means that even if you're here in eighth grade, you can begin to have that same kind of adultness. You can still have that same kind of maturity. Because you've been given, you've been entrusted, like Pierre Jojo said, you've been entrusted with a heritage and inheritance and to take responsibility for that and saying, okay, Lord, I don't want you to waste that on me. I want to use that. That spiritual maturity. But it takes a willingness to take responsibility. To say yes to the obligation. To say yes to the inheritance. To say yes to the responsibility and to say yes to the duty. But here's the deal. That kind of responsibility takes discipline. And if obligation is a, is a dirty word in our, in our kind of culture right now, Discipline is also a dirty word in our culture right now. But I got to tell you this. There is no one that you admire. There is no one that you admire whose life was not marked by discipline. Think of any one of your heroes, any one of the people you look up to, anyone you, say, you look at and say, wow, man, they've got the life. Not one of them has lived a life that was not marked by discipline. Why? Because there's a man, um, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a former Navy SEAL. His name is Jocko Willink. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jocko Willink. Um, Jocko is his name, and that's, I think, I don't know if his parents gave him that name, or he, that's a nickname, but he, if you ever listen to him or watch him, he looks like a Jocko, and he talks like a Jocko. Jocko Willink, he wrote a book, and the book is called Discipline Equals Freedom. Discipline Equals Freedom. I, uh, I, have you guys ever heard of Netflix? Is this something you have, you've heard of? Okay, so, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, on, years ago on Netflix, there was a documentary, and the documentary was called Surfwise. And it was about this man who had gone to medical school. I think he went to maybe Berkeley Medical School. Um, medical school out in, out in California. But he wanted to surf. So what he would do is he would work as a doctor, until he had enough money to then leave the hospital and then just surf. He would just surf all day whenever he wanted to. And uh, when he ran out of money, he would just go back to work as a doctor, make some money, and then stop working as a doctor and just surf. And as he was doing this, he met a young a woman who also liked that life. And so they married each other. And that's what they did. They, they would surf until they ran out of money. And then he would go back to work as a doctor and then raise some money and then go back. And they had, I think, something like six or seven kids. And what they did is they just, the first part of this, this documentary is really fascinating because it's these kids now, are now adults and they just described how awesome their childhood was. Because they have these, this mom and dad who's like, we just, we just surf all the time. They traveled around in a van, like a Scooby-Doo looking van, uh, right? Mr. Machine kind of thing. And, uh, and they lived out of their van. And they would surf all the time, and they, they would, they, in, the, in, the, in the, wow, easy for me to say. In the interviews, they would talk about how awesome it was to be a kid with these parents, to have nothing else to do but, but surf, and how jealous other kids their age were of them. And the first half of the documentary was just fascinating, all these stories about how awesome it was to grow up like this. 
halfway into the documentary, things turn, and they start being asked, well, how was your life now? He said it was a great life growing up, you know, being able to surf whenever you wanted to, living out of this van, and just whenever you hadn't needed money, your dad went back to work, and there it is. Adventure. Freedom. Every one of them talked about how they couldn't hold down a job. Every one of them talked about how hard it was for them to get a job. Every one of them said, yeah, I would like to, you know, start my own business, but I don't have the requisite skills. I would like to get hired by this company, but I don't have the degree. I would like to be able to try this and do this with my life. I would like to have the same freedom now that I did when I was a kid, but because I didn't have discipline as a kid, now I am a slave to my circumstances. Contrast their lives, the beginning of their lives, and the end of their lives, you know, their grown-up lives, with their father's beginning of his life and his grown-up life. Their dad was disciplined when he was young. He worked through school. He worked through medical school. And because he put in that discipline, because he put in that work, because he did what he was supposed to do, then he was able to do what he wanted to do. But his kids, because they only did what they wanted to do, later on, they were not able to do what they wanted to do. Why? Because discipline equals freedom. I was uh, listening to Jocko, right, the former Navy SEAL. He was talking about how he was on Instagram, and he had posted uh, his morning. His morning involved, he gets up every morning at 4 a.m., and he, <laughs> and he got up at 4 a.m., and he worked out. He had a picture of him, like, you know, working out in his, in his home gym. And he went surfing later on that morning, and then he, like, did sat by the beach and did something, you know, had breakfast or something by the beach. And he posted these three photos of, you know, working out, surfing, and then having breakfast on the beach. And he said he thought it'd be fun. You know, that's what Instagram's for, right? Post your life and let people know what you're up to. And he said something like, his tag was like, you know, great morning out here and wherever he lives. And then he left it. And later on that day, all the people commenting, at one, one of the comments stuck out to him. And it was someone who had come up on his, you know, his Instagram account. I saw the pictures, and all they wrote was, must be nice. And he said, when I saw it, I was like, what the? But I thought, I don't need to respond. This is the internet. It's supposed to make you mad. <laughs> but he said there was kind of this, like, this, these three, those three words, just kind of, with a little, little, you know, grain of sand in the microchip of his brain, just like, I can't get him out of my mind. It just must be nice, must be nice, must be nice. And he's like, man, so later on that night, he went back to like, do I answer? Do I respond? What do I do? He opens it back up. And he sees the comment, three words, must be nice. But someone already replied to that guy with three words. And those three words were, discipline equals freedom. Because Jocko had spent the majority of his early life working very hard. Yes, it must be nice to be able to now get up at 4 a.m., go surfing, and have breakfast on the beach. Why? Because he put in the work doing what he needed to do, so now he can do what he wants to do. He took responsibility for himself as a Navy SEAL, took responsibility for his brothers, his comrades, for his country. And now he has the freedom. He has the ability to do what he wants to do. Why? Because discipline equals freedom. Because obligation is not a bad word. Because responsibility is what every single one of us need. Because all of us, what we need to do is we need to do our... And so, how do you gauge your ministry, Father Mike? By maturity by the degree to which our students are willing to take responsibility for themselves. What does that look like? Well, it looks like... It doesn't look like checking boxes, I'll say that. Let me say that right away. It doesn't look like checking boxes. Sometimes we think the spiritual life, taking responsibility for yourself, is just like, okay, I do the things. Because I know maybe a lot of people here who come to Lifeline on a Saturday night, if you came here on purpose, like without anyone else forcing you, you might be a box checker. You might be the kind of person who's like, okay, Father Mike, tell me what to do to be holy, and I'll do those things. This, I'll go down the list. You might be a box checker. It's not merely about checking the boxes. It's about more than just checking the boxes. Because taking responsibility, being a mature Christian, is not simply about doing the tasks. It's about the heart of the whole thing. Yes, it involves doing the tasks. But it's more important to say, it's about the relationship with Jesus. 
and a relationship with his church. Like this is the key. The relationship with Jesus, the relationship with his church. A lot of us have a tendency or a temptation to define ourselves by our strengths. Like you might be one of those people. Like uh, if you're an athlete, like yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the good athlete. I can't think of a sport. I'm like, whatever, you fill in the blank. Um, if you play an instrument, like, yeah, I'm the musician. If you do anything well, it's like, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm really good at speech. I'm really good at debate. I'm the funny one. I'm the one who's really, really ridiculously good looking. <laughs> like, whatever your strength, we have a temptation. We have a temptation to define ourselves by our strengths. And that ends up becoming how we see ourselves. On the other hand, many of us here tonight have a temptation to define ourselves by our weaknesses. And we can define ourselves just as quickly and just as easily by our weaknesses as we can by our strengths. So if I, if I won, if I got an A, if I, if I was accepted by my group, then, then I'm a winner, then I'm smart, then I'm popular. And if I didn't get an A, if I didn't win, if I wasn't accepted by those people that I, I want to, to accept me, then I'm a failure, I'm dumb, I'm unwanted, I'm a loser. We define ourselves either by our strengths or by our weaknesses. This is what they call in the Bible, stupid. <laughs> it is dumb. Why? For many reasons. One of those reasons is, I love, well, here's, I love talking with college athletes. I love getting to know them over the course of their four or, you know, so years. Because if you get to college and you're a college athlete, like, you really work, you know how to work hard, you know discipline. If you get to college and you are an instrumentalist, you're a musician, and you play that instrument all through college, then, again, you know what to do. You've worked hard to be able to get to that place. I love talking with varsity athletes all the way through college. And my favorite, <laughs> that, this sounds bad. Um, one of my more positive moments that I somewhat enjoy <laughs> is the moment after their last game or the moment after their last race, the moment after their last competition. Because, think about this, here's a baseball player, and he has devoted his entire life since he was a kid, maybe five years old, maybe four years old, to baseball. And that dedication and that discipline has gotten him all the way through middle school, high school, got him to a college to play baseball for a college program on a varsity team. And then the moment that last game ends, He's someone who used to be a baseball player. I used to play baseball. The moment her last track meet is over, the moment she crosses the finish line in her last track meet is I used to run in college. The moment the last horn blows in the hockey game, I used to be a hockey player. And I love those moments. Not because they're just because they're so painful. They are very painful. Because that's the moment of truth. That's the moment when this athlete, that musician, that person knows where they got their identity. And it's those moments that I love having the conversation because at that moment, it's absolutely clear. You know, it's so funny. Uh, speaking of baseball, we had a young man uh, who transferred to UMD. He was a pitcher, super good, great athlete, great pitcher. Got to UMD and got the yips. If you know what the yips are, he couldn't throw the ball where he wanted to throw the ball, which is actually not uh, ideal for a pitcher. <laughs> I'm no expert in sports, but it's not one of those things. Uh, the guys on his team loved him. They, he, was one of the, he was one of the brothers. He was inside the whole thing. And then since he had the yips and couldn't get any better, the coach said, listen, you're done. 
that afternoon, his friends or who were his teammates were the guys who used to be his friends because they used to be his teammates. And it was a matter of like, no, I mean, hey, we like you and everything, but you're not on the team anymore. So we're moving on. And so at that moment, not only was he a used to play baseball guy, he also used to have friends on the team. So what defines you? Is it the strengths? Is it the weaknesses? This baseball player could have said, yeah, I'm the pitcher on a, you know, Division I or Division II college team. Or he could say, I'm the guy who got cut from the Division I or Division II college team. What am I? Am I a winner or am I a loser? What was remarkable was this man. He had, he had encountered Christ a year and a half before this. He'd gone to a place um, where they just clearly proclaimed, here is who Jesus is. Here's who Jesus says you are. And that whole last year and a half of his college career, his baseball career, he slowly, slowly grew away from, I'm a winner if I win. I'm a loser if I lose. He grew away from that to the place of, wait a second. God, I am who you say I am. God, I am who you say I am. The coach says, I'm no good. <laughs> but I'm not no good. God, I'm how you, I, God, God, I am who you say I am. The teammates say I'm awesome. One of the brothers. That's not who I am. God, I am who you say I am. We are so tempted to define ourselves by our strengths or by our weaknesses that we forget the voice of the one who actually knows us and knows the truth about our strengths and knows the truth about our weaknesses. So this is my invitation for every one of us. Before you identify yourself by your strengths or before you identify yourself by your weakness, to ask the question, God, who is it you say I am? Because it's that relationship with him that gives you your identity. So even when you fail to check the boxes, even when you fail to show up, even when you fail to have that discipline that equals freedom, God, I am not who, that failure. I'm who you say I am. You guys, this is why it's so absolutely critical, absolutely critical, that what we do is we take responsibility for the inheritance that's been handed to you, handed to us. Because if I'm willing to take responsibility for the inheritance that's been given to me, then I have the kind of faith, then I have the kind of identity that can thrive in any kind of circumstance. I have the kind of faith, I have the kind of identity that can thrive in any kind of environment. I have the kind of faith and I have the kind of identity that can thrive, like Pierre Giorgio said, even when the rest of the crowd is not going with me. Not just getting along, but getting to the goal. So here's what I'm going to propose. What I'm going to propose tonight is as we, as, we, as we lead into worship now, we're just going to say some prayers. We're going to, we're going to go into adoration. We're going to have this time of prayer. That spiritual maturity and spiritual freedom are not merely about doing the tasks. Yes, it is about taking responsibility. Yes, it is about doing the obligation. Yes, it is in part about the call of? But ultimately, ultimately it's going to be about, God, who do you say that I am? We all have these voices that come at us. Your strength saying you're awesome. Your weakness is saying you're a loser. What's God's voice say? God's voice says you're my beloved. God's voice says you're my son. God's voice says you're precious. God's voice says you're my warrior. To be able to take 
responsibility for your own spiritual growth. This is going to be the mark of adulthood. The mark of your true identity is not going to be in winning or losing. But listening to the voice of God and saying, okay, God, I believe you. The world says this is who I am. But I'm going to listen to who you say I am. Let's say a prayer. Father in heaven, you've called us to be your sons and daughters. You've made us your children. By the power of your Holy Spirit in our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us new life. You've given us a new identity. And ultimately what you've done is you've made us into your sons and daughters. And so we ask you tonight, remind us of who we are. That we're not the sums of our weaknesses, our sins, or failures. We are the sum of your love for us. For our capacity to be an image of Christ to this world. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to please remind us. Fight against who the world says we are. Remind us of who you say we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.